Well, good morning again, church family. It is good to see you. Uh, it's always exciting because we're kind of wrapping up one series and heading into another series. And so I'm excited to be talking about what we're talking about today. But I'm also excited that next Sunday we're going to be starting a new series called Red Letters. And uh, for those of you that know, if you have a Bible that has in the New Testament the words of Jesus all in red, that's what the series is all about. We're going to be looking at the words of Jesus starting with the Sermon on the Mount. And for the next several weeks together, we're going to be just focusing on the red letters and what that has to say to us. And, and just asking God's Spirit to say, okay, uh, God, let us look at these words in red, fresh and new, and know what it is that you have for us. Because I think there's something so powerful, right? And the entire Word of God, as we look at the Bible, it's all powerful, it's all inspired. But there's also something that's very special about just looking at what Jesus has to say. Uh, not just his life, but the words, the message. And uh, so we're going to start with the Sermon on the Mount and kind of work our way all the way into Easter uh, with the red letters. And so I'm really excited about that. I hope that you'd be excited about that as well. Invite some people. It's always a good time of year to invite new people to church, right? For people that may have never been or maybe have got disconnected somewhere along the way, it's an exciting time to be able to do that. And so uh, that's going to be starting next Sunday. So I hope you don't miss that. And, and by the way, if you've never uh, been here before, this is your first time, you can download our church app. Uh, just uh, type it, if you have an Apple or an Android, it doesn't matter, Christian Church Limit Grove, you'll find it there uh, uh, through our church app, and you can download that. Uh, you'll also be able to have access to all of our sermons online. Um, you'll have access to uh, giving online. You'll have access to a Bible. There's a Bible on our app. And so we'd love to have you to, uh, to do that, okay? Um, we're, you can also go through our website. We, we try to let you know, too, uh, make it an easier step for you. Just follow the link on our website, and that'll take you to uh, the mobile app. But... Uh, like I said this morning, we're finishing up our series, Advent Conspiracy, and, and can you believe, I mean, I don't know what it is, but it seems like the older that I get, these years just seem to go by faster and faster, and, and, and here we are at the end of another year, right? Next, next Sunday when we gather together, it'll be a new year, and uh, so it's, it's crazy to me to, to think about how fast time seems to go. You blink, right? Bam, all of a sudden you're at the end of it, and so... Uh, I don't know if you had a chance already, or if you're kind of in the process of doing that, just reflecting on another year that God has given you and, and, and what, what God has done this past year. Um, I pray, I hope, that 2018 has been a good year for you. I hope that it's been a good year for your family, that when you think back, you think of a lot of good memories along the way. I know that for some of you, that's not the case, right? When you think back, to this previous year and some circumstances that you've been going through or some of, some of the tough things of life that, that you've kind of been handed down this past year, you're, you're kind of like a lot of people who says, I, I can, can't wait till this year ends and a new year begins, right? As we think about a new year and new possibilities of a fresh new start, one of the things that I love about this time of year is all of the, the hope and, and excitement because you have the hope and excitement for Christmas and then you have the hope and excitement from a new year that we all look forward to. Speaking of which, I remember hearing one time about the great evangelist Billy Graham and he told this story where he was preaching at this little town of Mount Holly, North Carolina, right? There was this little town, uh, suburb kind of community and it happened to be the Sunday before Christmas when he was preaching, and he was doing this revival, and so he wasn't just preaching on Sunday morning, he was also preaching on Sunday night. And so Sunday afternoon, in between the services, uh, he was walking down the sidewalk, and he was looking for the post office because he needed to drop off a letter in the mailbox, and he came across this young boy who was also walking down the sidewalk, and he stopped to ask him, and he said to him, he said, excuse me, young man, where can I find the post office? And so the little boy directed him where he should go, and Billy Graham thanked him, of course, and then he told him, he says, young man, if you'll come to church this evening, and he told him where the church was, you can hear me tell everyone about how, how we can get to heaven. How's that sound? So the little boy thought for a moment, and he replied, well, I think that I'm gonna give your sermon a pass, sir. After all, you didn't even know how to get to the post office. How can you tell me how to get to heaven? 
Well, I'm excited that you're here today as we wrap up this Advent Conspiracy Series and we're talking about this topic of loving all. Loving all. I can't tell you how good it is to hear your feedback. I, I've been able to talk to many of you about what God is doing in your heart this Advent season and, and how the messages that we're talking about has been kind of stirring things in your life. And, and, and we're, we're praying that God just do something big, right? Something, something bigger than ourselves, that God changes our hearts and our lives. I mean, when we think about the Christmas story, that's really what we're talking about is a life-changing story, how Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, would not only change us, right, and not only change our lives and how we live, and, 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 and it would literally just change our world forever. That's how meaningful this season really is. That's how meaningful, as we think about and reflect on Christmas, how it literally has changed our world forever. But that's not always what we see in culture, is it? And that's kind of what this series has been all about. In fact, much of what we see in our, in our new cultural narrative of when it comes to Christmas is how God, you know, not, not so much that he, how he has changed or continues to change our world through the greatest gift he could give us in Jesus, but, but rather, you know, how we need to focus on ourselves, right? That's the new cultural narrative of Christmas and, and how we can get what we want out of it and, and how we can kind of not get or give what people need, but rather get and receive whatever it is that we're looking for. And it's kind of how our society has hijacked the meaning of Christmas to make it something that it really was never intended to be. Make it about things like consumerism and materialism and price tags and selfishness and greed and dollar signs and debt. I mean, those are a lot of the things that surround our Christmases. What if there's a better way that's what this series has been all about. What if there's something we could do differently? What if we could conspire together, right, to, to, to make Christmas meaningful again? And, and how could we worship fully, right? That was our first week. That was our first topic. Worship fully the way that God wants us to, the way that he deserves, giving God all the glory, right? We ask ourselves this, what's really vying for your heart? What, what are you giving your hearts over to? And how does that affect how you live? How does that affect how we invest our time, our money, right? How, how, how can we spend less and give more? That was one of our topics, spending less on the things that really don't matter and more on the things that do. Jesus said it himself very plainly, life is not about an abundance of possessions. God gave us something more than a possession. He, he gave us his presence. When we think about who Jesus is, he gave us something very, very personal in his son. And so the question we have to ask ourselves sometimes is, okay, well, how do we do the same thing? How do we give something personal? How, how, how do we give Jesus relationally, right, with the people around us? And, and how can we live simply so that others can simply live? Those are the type of questions that we've been asking ourselves this entire series. And it's really kind of a moment of truth, right? It's kind of one of those things where we reflect and we think to ourselves and we make some important decisions about life. Speaking of which, one of the things that I've been doing throughout this series is playing a movie clip of some of my favorite Christmas movies, right? And we've seen some good ones so far. We've seen Elf and and, and, and uh, Christmas with the Cranks and, and some really, really good uh, movie clips. Well, the one I have for you this morning isn't just one of my favorite movie, Christmas movies. It's actually one of my favorite movies of all time. And, and by far, it, it ranks higher than in any of the rest. So the clip I have for you today is, I'm going to just ask you guys, how many of you ever seen the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? Let me see a raise of hands, okay? I thought probably many of you have. Right, it's a wonderful life. One, it's it's my favorite movie of all time. It's a classic, right? Donna Reed, Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart, of course, plays George Bailey in the movie. If if you've seen it, for those of you that that have seen it, the movie it, it covers a span of of thirty years, right? And for those of you that have in it, it covers from 1919 when George Bailey was only 12 years old. And it goes up through the years, through the Great Depression, all the way to 1945 during World War II. What's fascinating about the movie, and I posted this actually on my Facebook this last week, but Jimmy Stewart, I don't know how many, how many of you know this or not, but in 1941, 
Jimmy Stewart left, I mean, he was a very accomplished Hollywood actor already. He left his career in Hollywood and joined the U.S. Army. He became the first big-name movie star to enlist in World War II. He, he, like I said, he, he was already accomplished in Hollywood. He was also an accomplished pilot. And so when he, when he joined the U.S. Army, they, they put him in the Air Force as an aviator, and he earned his second lieutenant commission in early 1942. And then they used his celebrity status and his huge popularity, and they assigned him to things like recruiting. And he attended all these rallies, and, and he was training all these younger pilots, but he wasn't satisfied with that. If you know his story, you know it to be true that he wasn't satisfied with just sitting on the sidelines and he wanted to fly combat missions in Europe. And so in 1944, he was already a captain by then. He was deployed to England where he spent the next 18 months flying a B-24 Liberator bomber over Germany. Throughout his time overseas, the U.S. Army, they, they tried to keep him from harm's way. They tried to keep him from enemy territory, but Jimmy Stewart wouldn't have anything of it. He was determined to lead by example for those around him, and he assigned himself to every combat mission that he could. By the end of the war, he was one of the most respected and decorated pilots in his unit. But many of you know, and some of you that have served in the military, you know this all too well, all that came at a personal price. In the final months of World War II, he was grounded for what we call today PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. When he returned to the U.S. in 1945, he was a totally different person, a changed man. He had lost so much weight that he looked very sickly. He rarely slept. Whenever he did, he would have these extreme nightmares of planes exploding and men falling through the air screaming. In fact, in one mission, it was said that he lost 13 planes and 130 men, most of whom he knew personally. He was very depressed. He couldn't focus. He refused to talk to anyone about his war experiences. Many thought his acting career was over. But in 1946, he got the break, and he was asked to play George Bailey in... It's Wonderful Life, as you know, the suicidal father. The rest is history. What I found interesting about reading that story and the clip you're about to watch, the actors and actresses and the crew members, when they were watching him on the screen, they realized that he wasn't just acting, but it was actually his PTSD that was acting up and causing those emotional outbursts at times. So the scene you're about to watch is uh, when George is kind of, he's feeling at the end of his rope. He's at this moment of desperation and he, he just prays and he calls out to God for help. Watch this video. That's been my prayer uh, for us, is that this series would give us an opportunity to reflect. It gives us an opportunity to seek God's presence and to seek God's guidance to a better way. That's been my prayer, is that God would show us the way forward, show us how this incarnation, right? And I love the incarnation. It's, it's more than just a story. It's, it's really an invitation. As we think about Jesus being with us, God with us, Emmanuel, it's an invitation for us to be a part of a much bigger story. In fact, if you got your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to look at a, a few different scriptures. And I, want to, I want us to start in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, if you brought a Bible, if you're not, that's okay. I'll have it on the wall behind me. But Paul is describing here what we're talking about really in the incarnation. Jesus being born, God stepping into our world and giving us himself. And what a tremendous humble act that is that God does. And look, look at verse 6 in chapter 2. It says, Jesus, who, who being in the very nature God, did not, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. And the Bible says, even death on a cross. 
Listen to how Paul describes it here. Jesus made himself nothing, he says. Jesus took the very nature of a servant and he humbled himself and he allowed himself to become obedient to death. Literally, that means God putting on mortality, right? The immortal God putting on mortality for us. And even worse, it says, Jesus, Jesus even chose to die on a cross. He, he chose that rejection, that humiliation, even you know, the idea that, that Jesus was sinless, he was perfect in every way, but he yet took on our curse, our sin. He took on our faults, our frailty. I mean, you think to yourself, why? Why would he do that? Why would he take on that much, right? Why would he take on our sin, all the sin of the world? And it comes to one answer. It's the only answer I can give you. It's the only answer that you really need. And it has to do with our topic this morning. The one word that I would give you is love. You see, the only way we can explain any of this is God's love for us. Remember what we said a couple weeks ago, you matter to God, right? That's what we talked about. Why? Because he loves you. And the best part about that is we don't have to earn that love. According to the Bible, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 it says, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And if you follow on to verse 19, just a few verses over, we love because he first loved us. And you need to internalize that this morning because God first loved you, because God first loved me. He chose us first. You didn't have to earn it. You never have to. You never will. God initiated that love for us. And here's the point. God loves us so that we can in turn, guess what? Love others. That's how it's designed. Remember the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave, right? To love who? God, right? With all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one was love your neighbor as yourself. God, God essentially pours out his love in our hearts so that we can then in turn pour out that love for others. And that's the reason this fourth level of Advent conspiracy is called love all. Think about it. Love is powerful, isn't it? Love is, is so very powerful. By far the strongest force in the entire universe. It's been said that love is higher, right, than the highest mountain. It's deeper than the deepest sea. It's better than the best toy you can buy. I mean, think about the best toy that you can have. It's better than a new iPhone. It's better than a new iPad, right? It's better than all of that. It's better than $1,000 to your favorite store, uh, right? It, it, it's better than, than a box of expensive chocolates. It, it's better than catching the biggest fish, right? It's better than going out and, and winning a 70-inch flat screen TV, right? It's better for those, those of you that are, you know, golf enthusiasts, right? It's better than, than hitting a hole in one, right? It, love is better than all of that. It's better than, for me, this is a big one. It's better than losing 30 pounds, right? That's good, but love is better, it, it's better, it's better than, than watching your favorite movie. It's better than a full belly. It's better than a full refrigerator. It's better than a full bank account. Love is better. It's better than, than a baby. Those of you that are parents, right? It's better than a baby that sleeps all night. It's better than toddlers that don't whine all day, right? Love, love is better than, than your elementary child, you know, getting along with their siblings, right? It's better than, than a teenager who is, appreciative and cooperative, right? Love is better than even those things. It's, it's better than, you know, for those of you that are grandparents, right, and the grandkids come over and, and you get to have all that fun and then they get to go back home, right? It, you know, love is better than even, than even that. It's better than your 16-year-old coming and giving you a, a kiss on, on, on the cheek. Love is better. It's why thousands and thousands of songs, literally thousands and thousands of songs have love in the title, Nearly 200 number one songs throughout history have love in the title. That's how important and powerful love is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Most people call that the love chapter. I'm sure some of you have read it. It says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, 
I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if, if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, the Bible says I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. That's how powerful, I want you to think about this, that's how powerful love is. You can have the greatest faith, you can serve God, you can trust God with your life, you can give away everything that you have, even sacrificing your very life, but if you lack love, the love of God in your life, the Bible says you've done it for nothing. In 1 John chapter three, verse one, it says this, it says how great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. That is the power of love. If, if I could think of any other verse in the Bible, I mean, that would be it. Because we are included into God's family, that he is our father and that he calls us his children. Love, and this is what I love about love, love includes us. Right? It includes us. We are adopted into God's family because of his love for us. Think about that. And that's how this kind of ties into Advent conspiracy. God breaking through the barrier that separates us from him and becoming Emmanuel, God with us. One of the more quoted verses in all the Bible is John 3.16. I know many of you know that by heart. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son. But I want us to focus just on those two words that God gave. He gave. Maybe, maybe there may not be two more important uh, words in the entire Bible that God gave, that he gave. He, it originates from God, right, that he gave. It begins with him. He is the initiator. In fact, in, in John chapter 1, Verse one, that's what it says. It says, in the beginning was the word. And again, this is kind of John's way of describing the beginning of all things, including the birth of Christ. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, nothing was before him. Right, I mean, that's what we can gather from this. It began, it began with him, talking about God, talking about Jesus, and from him, everything came, right? And then John says in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So not only does, does God originate from the beginning, and from the beginning does God establish his giving nature, but the greatest gift that the world has ever known, right, the word taking on flesh and dwelling among us. Why? Again, it comes back to one simple answer. He loves us. He loves you because he loves you. And, and I mentioned, you know, this, but we quote John 3.16 a whole lot, but you may not know 1 John 3.16. You know, again, some other books that John wrote later in the New Testament, 1 John Chapter three, verse 16, it's just as powerful. It says this, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. There's no greater act of love than Jesus coming into our world for us. And here's the deal. It's intended to be a model for us. In other words, it's intended not just to show us how much God loves us, but it's inviting us to be a part of that same story and then to go and do likewise. God loves us. Why? So that we could love him and then show others that same love. Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. Paul says it like this. He says, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness that you have for others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, so that through his poverty, what? We might become rich. 
Paul says, I want to test the sincerity of your love. How? By comparing it with your earnestness to serve others and love others. How well do you love others? And then it goes on to explain, using Jesus as an example, which is always, by the way, a good thing to do, using Jesus as an example for us to follow, right? Jesus gave up the glory of heaven to be born in this sin-scarred world. He chose to leave perfection of heaven to be with us, right? He explains, though he was rich, he became poor so that through his poverty, we might become rich. You see, the greatest gift to us is also a model for us to live for others. So what does it mean? Here's what I think it means. How we understand that God loves us and and how he shows us that he loves us is how we are to also go into the world and love those around us. And, and we, we discuss areas of, of God being with us, right, and, and what that means and, and how that's a model for us. But, but what our goal is now is to translate that out into our lives and, and how we are to live our lives. And so here's what I want to do with the rest of our time this morning. I want us to look, I want us to consider this idea of what God has done for us, how he loves us, right, and how we are to love others. But I don't want us to stop there. I want us to ask ourselves, right, How would this change? How would this change my life right now if I started doing this? How would this change our church? How would this change our community if we started living this out right now? So let me, me, let's start with this. Thinking about Emmanuel, God with us, God communicating his love for us. If If you're taking some notes, write this first thing down. Here's what that means. God with us means this, God communicating to us. I love you, and I'm not far away. Write that down. I love you, and I'm not far away. No matter who you are or where you are, this is God's message to us. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you've come, God with us tells us that he's not far away. Not only that, but he's pursuing us, right? That, 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 that he, he is, you know, in tune with whatever our hurts are and whatever it is that's going on in your life, whatever struggles that you're facing, he cares about whatever pain that you are suffering. He's pursuing you. He wants to let you know how much that he loves you, that he's not far away. And here's really the first lesson for us in that. How do we love all by being like Jesus. We too have to be, right, with the hurting. We too have to be with the lost. We have to not be far away from them. Where we're, 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 I think as a church, sometimes we've made some of the biggest mistakes, and, and I'm not just talking about our church, I'm talking about the church in general, worldwide, the body of Christ, is that when we see the world and, and we think to ourselves, well, they have to come to us, right? They have to come into our buildings. They have to come to our events. And and really what we see in the New Testament as the example of the church is the church going out, outside the walls, to the people, to the masses, to the hurting. We see this in Jesus' own life. He goes to the sick. He goes to the outcast. And he's telling us to do the same thing. To go, right, and make disciples of all nations. Not only do we have to be aware of those that are, that are hurting, those that are lost, those are, that are struggling with hope, right? But love compels us to go, just like Jesus did, to not be far away, but to be close. And so that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. If you're taking notes, write this down. God communicated he loves us through Emmanuel by saying to us, not only... I'm not far away, but you're not alone. And there's a distinction here, and I want to point this out, that no matter what it is that you're going through or how bad it is, you're not alone. Wherever you are, whatever you're facing, God is there, right? God is here. Whatever financial pressure you're up against, whatever family turmoil that you're going through, whatever marital situation that you're up against, right? Relational issues, God is saying, don't be afraid, take courage, I'm here. 
Even when God seems quiet and, and he seems silent, even when you can't always feel his presence and, and you can't see him at work, in whatever situation or circumstance you're in, God wants to remind us you're not alone. Not only am I not far away, but you're not alone. And the second lesson that I think that we can take away from this is simply this. How well do we love like Jesus loves, right? Emmanuel, God with us, by helping others face whatever trial, whatever circumstance of life they're up against. What I would call it is this. It's the power of presence. It's the power of presence in someone's life. Simply helping share whatever burden someone is having to carry at the time. I love a story in Exodus 17, and I know I've shared this before, but it's a story of the Israelites, and they're defeating the Amalekites, and some of you may be familiar with this story. In Exodus 17, in verse 9, it says, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua, it says, fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up on top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. So you get the picture here, right? As long as Moses had his hands lifted up, right? The Bible says it, that, that they were winning. But whenever they fell down, they were losing. Let me ask you, have you ever tried to lift your hands for a long period of time? I mean, more than just like a minute, right? More than a couple of minutes. It's taxing, right? It's really difficult to do. Some of you, I know I've talked to Elmer before about this. He was a trouble man, you know, worked up on these poles, had to work with his hands over top of his head for long periods of time. It's a really difficult and painful experience. Imagine having to do that all day long. And so here in verse 12, what do they do? It says, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Then Aaron and Hur held up his hands, right, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. I have a picture here I want to show you that I just pulled offline, and I think it's a, a good picture, just kind of show you what it is that we're talking about. Talk about sharing burdens, right? It's a beautiful picture of this idea. It's going through life with another person, not only sharing the joys of life, but also when life gets tough, the burdens, when life gets messy, when tragedy strikes, when pain is prevalent, right? When, when blood is spilled or, or tears are, are falling, right? When, when, when someone, you know, gets the best of you and you just want to feel like you give up. Someone is right there sharing that experience, holding you up, holding your arms when you get tired. I've said this countless times over and over and again. Maybe you have as well. It could be when tragedy strikes in your life, a death in the family, you know, some, some kind of marital issues happening, a child going through a difficult circumstance of life. I can't imagine how I would ever get through that without my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I can't imagine those that are outside of the church and, and those that don't belong to a church family and when they're going through those tough times, how they're going through it alone. Well, that's, that's the second area that we're talking about, this idea that God is telling us you're never alone. And not only that, the third way that God communicates he loves us is through Emmanuel saying to us, don't give up. Don't give up. Not only am I not far away and close by your side, and you're not alone, but don't give up. I am with you no matter what. And, and I want to work through you no matter what. If you'll just let me, don't give up. 
Don't give in to temptations. Don't give up on, on what I have in store for you. Don't give up on the promises that I have for you. Don't give up on the vision that I've cast before your life. Don't let the world, don't let obstacles come in and, and whatever it is that you're up against, right, get the best of you. Don't give in to all of the pressures of this world. God says to us, I love you. I'm not far away from you. You're not alone and don't give up. This is where I believe that me, myself as a Christian, that, that we sometimes as a body of Christ, when it comes to these areas that we're talking about this morning, that we've really seems to have fallen short. I mean, you think about it, the world around us is literally drowning in sorrow and pain and turmoil and strife. You know, if you're not going through yourself, you know people in your life, your friends, your coworkers that are going through those things. They're up to their necks in heartache, right? They're empty, right? Because of their, their pursuits in life have left them empty. They're literally drowning in all of that stuff. And what is not needed is more self-help books, right? Let's be honest here. What is not needed is, is more things that you can buy with money or possessions. What is needed is, is, is this idea is that we, we need a life raft. We, we need a savior. It, it, don't get me wrong. It, it's, not about, it's not about you being a savior, right? It's not about us going out and pretending that, that we are Jesus in any kind of way. But it is about us going out and being the hands and feet of Christ and pointing them to the one person that makes all of their life worth it. Pointing them to the one person that could give them hope in the midst of all despair. I think we tragically miss out sometimes on simply being better encouragers as Christians. If there's ever a, a society of people that would be considered the, the, the biggest encouragers, it should be us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. I love this verse. It says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Did you hear that instruction? Encourage one another. Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, love one another, let God do his part while we do ours. The Bible calls us to be ambassadors, right? Carriers of the gospel, carriers of Christ. That means that we are to carry the good news of the gospel to everyone, to share Jesus. We are called to give this message, literally, right, to the very ends of the earth, to everyone who needs it. I was thinking this morning as I was praying about this message and God does this a lot, man. He just laid this scripture on my heart. I didn't even have it in my notes. I should have probably, but I didn't. And so God just wanted me to share it with you this morning. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And listen to this part. And let us not give up. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, church. There are people in your life right now, and you may be one of them. There are people in your life right now that are about to give up. They're about to give in. Don't let them. Love them to Jesus. Be with them. Don't let them go through whatever it is that they're going through. Don't let them go through that alone. The one admonition that God has kind of impressed upon me in this message is simply this. God didn't give up on me and God didn't give up on you. So don't give up on anyone else. Let's pray.